huge shout out to our amazing presenting sponsors. You see her on the screen. Thank you so much for investing in this conversation. The elevation has been wonderful all across the nation throughout this pandemic and want to say thanks for all of your support to make this happen. Julia Patrick, of course, is the co-host of this amazing show. Julia is the CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Thanks, Julia. Hey, and I am welcome. honored to be here with her as the co-host, Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd, CEO of The Raven Group. And today I am thrilled because Eric Ryan and I have already had an amazing conversation. And if the show is anything like this conversation, you're all in for a treat. So Eric is the founding partner at Mission Met. Welcome, Eric. Well, thank you. And uh, it's a, you two are a heck of a lot of fun. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah. And I'm, looking at my, I'm looking at my photo there and I'm looking at my screen here. So it's something that's happened with <laughs> that photo, like a lot of people these days. But uh, We'll see if it turns back to that photo again someday, but that's me. <laughs> I, I like it. I'm so glad you can join us. Thank you. I'm super, super glad to, to be here. So tell us what Mission Met is and what you do. You Let's start you. there. Sure. So uh, Mission Met, it, it, it's, it's all about its name, really. We're, we're a small business that help small nonprofit organizations meet their mission. That's essentially what we do, what, that, that's sort of at, at a vision and mission sort of level. Specifically or more tactically, what we do is we focus specifically on providing practical strategic planning services that takes a form of consulting training uh, to, uh, in, in a practical sort of way. We've reimagined a strategic planning process, which I can get into. Yeah. Um, and everything that we do is supported by a software tool that we created specifically to facilitate and catalyze strategic planning effectiveness for small organizations. So it's this combination of technology and a newer way of looking at strategic planning. Because I don't know, I mean, you, strategic plan, planning in the nonprofit space often gets a bum rap. And frankly, I think it deserves it a lot of the time because it takes too long, costs too much money, and doesn't, desert, doesn't always deliver on the results that you want. And so we're trying to do something about that and make it, because we think everyone should have a strategic plan, but the right type and the right type of process to support it. And That's to use bit. it and to implement it. You know, we used to say strategic plans are great. They might be required as an annual, you know, right. responsibility, but then they collect dust either on a bookshelf or digitally nowadays. Yeah. And this could not have come at a better time because one of my big service lines that I offer is strategic planning for nonprofits. And I just found out, <laughs> so I'm really excited to learn from you, genuinely, uh, that my, my upcoming retreat, uh, two weekends from now, has been moved outside. Oh, wow. Due wow. to COVID. So yeah. we will be under a Ramada with pick tables, which totally changes and reimagines the way I've ever facilitated a strategic right. plan. So come on, give it to me. <laughs> well, well, you know, I was going to say, we have a phrase that, you know, you want to get uh, your plan off of your shelf and onto your calendar. And that's, yes. and you take that line, run with it, because it sort of communicates what, what we feel like is the biggest problem with strategic planning in small organizations. And you can use this, in, you know, at, at your picnic party that you're doing here soon with your, with your group, is helping an organization. So I, I was thinking in preparation for this conversation, and, you know, I didn't know exactly where, where we would go, but... What are some key takeaways that I hope your audience can take away from this that will help them as they're thinking about strategic planning and perhaps the two of you in your work mm -hmm. is thinking of strategic planning as a process as opposed to an event. That's a cornerstone of what people, yeah. people talk about. Oh, I need a plan. I need a plan. What you really need in the years that I've been doing this, I've been doing this for 23 years, is you want a process, a component of which is a plan. And if you can help the leaders of the organizations reframe that, now you're off to the races because it's not just a plan. It's something that's active, dynamic, can be used, what, whatever the time frame it is. And, um, and I'll, I'll just say, too, uh, quickly, I know you asked uh, Julia about the business in Mission Met. Um, I'm a 50-50 partner with my business in Ohio. I'm in California, and we have a, a small, awesome, awesome team. So it's not just me. It's, it's a team of people that are mm -hmm. trying to deliver what we do. You know, I love that. And I think maybe um, I've, I've learned so much from you in just a short period of time. Let's back up a little bit and let's sure. talk about the value. Sure. Because sure. I want to get into, um, I, I want to start with this because I feel like I'm hearing from a lot of nonprofits that are like, screw the strategic plan. What good is it? 
Right. Absolutely. Now that we're in COVID. Yeah. And so I'm kind of thinking like, well, wait a minute, right. let's, let's not just ditch out an entire process. I loved what you said. It's, it's a, it's not an event. Yeah, absolutely it, not. I think that's what's happened. Yeah. It's kind of yeah. gotten lumped into all the canceled events and all the canceled, you know, event mentality things that yeah. we're doing. So yeah, it, yeah that's a killer. If people, and, and it's so common, uh, Julie and Jarrett, that people think of the strategic planning as events. So if you and we can help the nonprofit leaders out there understand that it really is a process. And frankly, you can apply that mindset to your board development process or your development or your um, fund development process or your staff development. You know, all these processes that go into building the capacity of a small organization, strategic planning as a process is, is the same conceptually. I mean, it's obviously, it's a different topic, but it's the same concept that it's yeah. a process you're putting into place. And that's where you get the, the, the return on all of this and build up the capacity so that you can hit your mission more effectively. Now, in, in terms of, you know, why you'd want to do this right now, you don't want to rush out and create, in most cases, some three to five year strategic plan right this moment. There's too many variables right now. So I would agree with most, most organizations that now is probably not the time uh, to try to put your hat in the ring on a three to five year plan with everything that's going on. It, some organizations, perhaps that's true, where they're really getting, uh, maybe you're a health organization or you're an organization that is really being demanded, uh, you know, people are really demanding your services and you can see that you can see the horizon. But the strategic planning concept is the same whether or not you're thinking about it for six months or a year out. And absolutely, if you can, in the concept being, where do we want to be in six months or a year, which is, you know, it's going to change some, but you have some clarity on that at this point, even with COVID. And then how are we going to get there? And that strategic framework, you just apply to a longer term when you're doing a deeper strategic planning process. Mm -hmm. You know, the value of it for sure uh, reduces stress. Um, you, you both know that when you write down for yourself or with a team of people, um, you get clarity, just the process of writing it down reduces stress that's backed up by research. Um, it, you help to raise more money. Uh, we did a research project at Mission Met um, several months ago where we interviewed, uh, we're not interviewed, that's not true. We, re we did a, a survey of um, small nonprofits literally on every continent except Antarctica. And the data that we got back showed that for those organizations that didn't have a strategic plan, let's say, uh, the, the way the math worked out, let's say you're a $500,000 nonprofit annual revenue with no strategic plan. If you have a strategic plan and you're using it, $722,000 nonprofit. You got a 44% increase. So, so, you know, you all know that, but that was, those are some real numbers. It's not incredibly scientific, but it was based on data that we got from organizations around the globe. So um, you raise more money, you can streamline your programs and, and so on. And it, and it, in terms of benefits to right now during COVID, if you've got a roadmap, it's a place where you and your team can start to, uh, to address those decisions that you're trying to make in real time right now. Without that plan, then it becomes much more difficult during a stressful crisis uh, like what right. we have. Yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, I know with Jarrett, I mean, Jarrett spends a lot of time with nonprofits around the globe that talking about strategic planning and and administrating, you know, these call to actions, if you will, for group. And I am always fascinated sitting at all of the different strategic planning sessions that I've sat in over my trajectory of service. There's so few people from the organization in the room. Mm. It just tends to be the board members. And I mm. always think to myself, shouldn't there be other people here? Shouldn't this be you know, the people like that are in the trenches doing this work. And so I'm really curious to ask you about that. Like who should be involved right. and what does this look like so that you don't get these crazy demands that, you know, privileged board members come up right. with that have no bearing in, in what's right. going to go on. I couldn't agree more with you. A real quick story. And I'll respond to your question. About <laughs> 10 years ago, I saw this strategic plan landed on my desk. It was put together by 70 people. It was 42 pages. It was drop dead gorgeous, spiral bound, beautiful photos, all that sort of stuff. It was for an organization with one part-time staff member, member and an annual budget of $25,000. It was, it was to, to me, it was actually criminal. Uh, the consultants well-meaning that led the group through the process, super well-meaning, but you know, they, they, and they did not implement that obviously. So to your point, Julie, like, you know, it, it's, it is, it's an important question. 
I would argue, first of all, the real answer to this is there's a nuance to this that varies from organization to organization. I wish I could give like there's one answer, but there isn't because yeah. or, different organizations are, are different in their needs. I will say that at a minimum, the board's role, uh, at a minimum, they need to make sure that the organization has a strategy. Mm -hmm. That is just due diligence. That's just, you know, your, your responsibility as a board member, making sure we have something that's documented. How it then happens, how it's created, what sort of guidance they provide as a board, that can vary from organization to organization. I've seen small organizations where the staff comes up with it, presents it to the board for review. It works. I've seen where they've gotten together because of their particular culture. So um, I w there is, there's a phrase that, you know, people support that which they create. And so you want some level of engagement. And it doesn't have to be in the creation of the plan, per se. It could be just in the assessment process. Mm -hmm. But at Mission Met, we tend to... Um, get people engaged on the assessment, but then lean on a small core of people to sort of formulate the plan and the framework in draft form and then take it to the group for feedback. And what we found is the group tends to appreciate that A, they were engaged, and then B, they had an opportunity to provide feedback, but they didn't have to go through all the details that the leaders really know. But there's, it's authentic. You know, you really do want feedback. But that's sort of our formula. It does depend on, on different or on with the organization, its size and their culture and so on. But, um, You're right. There's so many nuances. I've been with organizations that, you know, there's a founder. And so right. they have, you know, kind of like their, their pet leaders, you know, that are really their right hand people. And then there's other organizations that absolutely bring in the directors to say, you know, we want your voice. We want to make sure that you're part of this planning. Right. Um, and that goes well too. And then Julia, there's, all volunteer led zero staff <laughs> you know yeah. Yeah. so it really is there's just so many nuances and i love that you said it's not an event it's a process and in <laughs> fact i've i have um reimagined how i offer my service that it's a four-part service and that way there's a quarterly check-in quarterly course correct and those clients of mine that have been with me through covid you know, it's not like, well, let's just ball that up and throw it away. It's now like, okay, let's get together. Let's reimagine what, what can we keep and what do we need to really think differently, you know? Absolutely. And Absolutely. talk to us about how now, I mean, I mentioned outside in a Ramada, you know, but typically for me, that board meeting or strategic plan, um, that event, those times oh, sure, are really sure, done person with post-it notes all around the, the room. Talk to me about like this virtual component now and how your organization and business has really, you know, reimagined that. What's, what's interesting is we found that most of our uh, customers' strategic plans, if we've been working with them for a while, are not significantly changing in what we call the compass, which is around the mission and the vision and the values and that sort of area. We, we, our vernacular, as we call that, the compass, it gives you long-term direction. Mm -hmm. Some of the tactics, however, of course, in two areas in particular, we're finding um, development and programs, having to pivot programs and having to, having to figure out different ways of raising money. And so that's where a concentration of our actual content conversations have typically been. Okay. The, the transition to a virtual facilitation, I've facilitated several since uh, March, several um, virtual facilitations, uh, continue to try to tweak. I mean, I've been doing virtual work for, you know, 20, 20 years, really, 23 years, as long as I've been doing this. But the actual virtual facilitations, somewhat before COVID, but, uh, but since then entirely. And what I found is... Uh, People, we, we break it up so we don't go a full day. You know, we spread it out over several days. We do two or three hours, typically two hours. We, we, we do that sort of process. Um, and what I found is it, we are missing a little bit of like the water cooler conversation uh, that it's hard to get that spirit in a virtual environment. One of the things we're doing, however, is we're sending gifts to the board members and staff, a physical mail uh, that they can open up prior to each of our meetings and ways to kind of light, lighten it up, sending them gift cards so they can order lunch in. So that we're treating them to lunch, even though we're not in person. The, one of the pros that I've seen to the virtual setting has been a higher degree of focus. Frankly, we got two hours, let's roll. And everyone, um, I just feel like there's been a higher level of engagement in a, in an odd sort of way than when I was doing this in person mm -hmm. with the group. Yeah. So I, I, uh, I, I haven't seen us lose a whole lot in the virtual environment is my, is my end, end sort of statement here. It's working uh, well. 
No, that's great. And especially digitally, the platforms offer so many bells and whistles. Absolutely. And, and there's really great uh, uh, tools you can use, facilitative tools, white, whiteboards you can use, uh, sticky dot, uh, you know, sticky note tools digitally you can do. So I haven't felt like we've really missed much. Um, Good. And, and Good. we'll be back together in person at some point. And we're saving a heck of a lot of resources right now, too, it's, it's, which is awesome. So, Eric, we have a question that's come in from Lauren. So okay. this is great information, Eric. What suggestions do you have to help motivate nonprofits to begin the strategic plan process, especially during the pandemic when many people are experiencing fatigue? Yeah, absolutely. And I think I might know who that Lauren is, believe it or not. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> so hello, Lauren, if that's you. Um, so um, start small. What I, I shared something earlier, and I'll, re, I'll revisit it. We believe that the framework for a three to five year strategic plan, that the, the actual sort of way we think about that is identical to when you're thinking about a six month plan. Uh, and, and, the, and the framework is this, what's our vision for what the organization is going to look like at some point in the future? And our, the creation of our plan bridges the gap from where we are now to that place. You can do the same sort of um, exercise for an organization as you think about this six months from now or a year. And even and if you cascade that down even one step further, which is the way I want to respond to, to, to Lauren's specific question, is you can take that so framework and apply it to your most critical, um, what we call focus areas in the organization. So a focus area would be development or a focus area may be board development or a focus area may be marketing. There's these buckets of work that we do in the organization. You can apply that same concept, and this is where we'll, this is a, a, a heck of a lot of the work that we've been doing over the last several months is helping people envision what their development looks like six months from now, as, as and what specifically needs to happen to get there. What barriers do we need to overcome? So, to Lauren's point, it's it's difficult to create right now when so many things are going on a really comprehensive strategic plan. I'm doing that with some customers but it's hard to do. But what people can self-facilitate on their own is taking that framework and applying it to a particular topic. And that, that sort of magic of where do we want this to be? What's our vision, our best guess? And where are we right now? What steps do we need to do to overcome the barriers to get there? And, you, and so if you start small and start to do that, that's strategy in a particular area as opposed to strategy for the whole organization. And then you can, as things calm down, you can you know, take that framework and, and apply it to more and more parts of your organization or, or work with you, Jared, or somebody to help them walk through that. So, um. so then let me ask you this question, because again, it's, I say this honest to goodness every day, um, but time is like winding down. <laughs> I told you it's Jen Till. She, she, does did it. <laughs> she did it. She's got nine minutes. Yeah. Look at that. God, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I say this every day and I have, I would have to witness to you. I'm genuinely shocked at how fast the time, time goes. Um, I want to know about the measurement. Yeah. When we're looking at right. measuring our outcomes, which everybody gets all tripped up on, I know I do. I get like super, I'll, I'll confess, I get super mentally beat up, even like within my own strategic planning, personally, you know, professionally, yeah. Yeah. organizations I work with, and I'm just like, Holy crap, this isn't yeah. working. I hate this. All right, let me help you out. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me give you, I'll, 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 th I'll throw two things to, at, at you that um, I think can really help. Um, and it goes back to this concept of a process. What, one of the differentiators of how we approach strategic planning, which is, you know, anyhow, we, we consider it to be a differentiator, is our overwhelming focus on the process. Okay. And so there's two ways that that sort of um, comes to bear. Number one, is this concept of process goals okay as opposed to results goals for so a process goal, i'll use a personal example a process goal might be to walk three times a week three miles right. a results goal might be to lose 10 pounds mm -hmm. right we are so driven and we have all the corporate guidance and our and our um uh, board members that work for corporations that have you know strategic planning departments and this and that that talk about you know it's got to measure everything we've got spreadsheets we can measure this and that and everything we're sort of like me measurement overrunning you got to have these metrics and you've got to have these outcomes and this and that and everything and i'm not arguing against that i'm really not there's value in those numbers absolutely but we've lost the but we haven't but, but what, what i've found and in fact some research backs this up is that if you can actually create process-based goals, 
and help your team focus on those, those processes help to build the capacity of the organization so that they can then be better, they have more capacity to raise the funds, to serve the children, to do whatever. And oftentimes there's so much of a push like, well, we got to serve this number of kids and we got to do that much money, but there's no process to sustain it. Research shows, um, and I've got a blog article about this and I can talk at length about this, but research shows that organizations that focus on process goals versus results goals are literally three times more effective at navigating change Wow. And going through process. It's really cool. It's, it's this golden piece of information that people don't talk about. So to help you sort of reduce the stress of that, Julia, like I got to hit this number, I got to do this. You can actually change the conversation at the outset by focusing on a process goal as a measurement. The other piece I'll just share is you can also measure the, um, your process and effectiveness of your strategic planning overall as a topic by not just measuring like, did we hit these goals, but are we meeting do we have one or two people that are serving of the champion of this process? Are we measuring our score on a regular basis? So are we, so you're measuring your effectiveness at the strategic planning process. And guess what? You know, if you f help your team focus on that, you can pat each other on the back virtually in person, whatever, and, and realize that we're building this muscle as a team. And with that muscle, we're now really going to be able to, uh, you know, be more effective at hitting the results that we really care about. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a different way of thinking, frankly, on the measurement that, I think, frankly, reduces your stress um, and frankly puts the focus on things that can actually have more impact than just the number itself. I like that because it is a process. It's not an overnight result, Absolutely including not. weight loss, right? Like it's a process. So if you can set goals towards your process, that makes a lot more sense. So and you can still make it specific and measurable. You document this process and it has to be documented and implemented by X. Did you do it? Can you hand me that process on a piece of paper or digitally or whatever? Like you can still measure it and make it specific and measurable at like a good goal, but it's a process as opposed to an actual number. And so anyhow, I just, I've seen the benefit of that just for a long time. And it's one of those pieces of uh, information that doesn't, that people don't hear enough, frankly. And it's really where the um, uh, success is in my opinion. Right. Um, just so you know, Lauren said, hi, Eric. Yes, it is me. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have what might be a, a huge humdinger and I want to be mindful of our time. So however you can answer this in, in the time remaining, sure. you mentioned compass, right? Those mission, vision, values, and that's really where's the organization going. How does mission met work with organizations that want to change their compass. They want to change their, their mission, their vision, and even their values. Right now, there is so much going on that a lot of organizations are really looking to stay relevant on top of, you know, community, right. community impact and results. Right. So how does Mission Met focus that switch on compass, if you will? Sure, sure. I'll, I'll in the limited time, I'll do my best to answer that. Sure. Um, the, uh, what we found is most of the org. So if you take the cornerstone of the, of what we call our compass as being the mission statement and the vision statement, mm -hmm. you get 17 different consultants in the room. You're going to get 17 different approaches to mission and vision. It's one of those weird things in the nonprofit space, but our particular approach is that the mission and the vision both are one sentence. Mm -hmm. The mission says what we do and for whom the vision says what the world or our community will look like as a result of us succeeding at our mission. Mm -hmm. Those two are two intertwined pieces. Often people try to make them all fit into a mission or they're this or that, or it's just like, and then people get all confused, but it's a really simple concept. What we found over the last several months with the change we've been facing is the vision has been pretty, um, the, what the world will look like. People generally, their visions and their organizations haven't changed a whole heck of a lot. And frankly, the mission hasn't really changed a lot, but some of the tactics to do that may have. So I'm frankly not seeing a ton of change right this moment in the mission and vision space. It's more at the tactical level. So we still, um, uh, we're, we're a theater. Um, one, one of our uh, customers is, is an African-American theater that operates in the San Francisco Bay Area. They aren't delivering their performances right now for obvious reasons. They have pivoted their pro product, however, to be radio performances and other sort of virtual performances and they're, and they're partnering with other organizations in different ways. Their tactic has changed, but their mission and their, their underlying vision stays, has remained relatively the same. Um, so 
to answer your question, Jared, I would approach it like that as sort of like, this is the, the field and this is the framework of this. Make sure we're all on the same page about what the mission and vision really is. And if in fact the need in the community or the need in the world that we're trying to meet as an organization has changed, then we may need to look at that mission and vision if there's actually no longer that need there. But, um, but uh, anyhow, I'm, I'm just co cognizant of time here. Well, you yeah. mentioned that you have some blogs and some other resources. So I know Julia, as she signs us off today, will share your information. And um, so I know I'm going to go nerd out about it for sure. And I, I appreciate all your time. Hey, it's been great. Um, I think we need to definitely have you back on to talk about some other things. Jared is always reminding me one of the big questions that we need to ask ourselves and everybody is what are you going to take forward? what has been working and what is a healthy change and how does that that move forward and so i think that's a big part of strategic planning um, again i'm julia patrick ceo of the american nonprofit academy joined by my wonderful host co-host um jared ransom the nonprofit nerd your nonprofit nerd my nonprofit nerd <laughs> um eric ryan yay team mission met I'm like a new super fan of yours. I really, really liked a lot of what you had to say. And um, you can go on to missionmet.com and read some of those blog posts. They really are great. I have uh, taken a look at them. There's some really interesting things that actually um, Eric wrote about, which led us to get him onto our show. So I, I really think it's a, a fabulous, fabulous um, resource and to talk with them. Hey, we want to make sure that we give uh, a lot of love to our presenting sponsors. Without you, we would not be here on our national show. Uh, we have now produced over 125 episodes. And again, these are the folks that have stepped up uh, to help us achieve that. Again, now streaming on Roku, 39 million new friends of the show. <laughs> so. It's super, super kooky, but all of the episodes, including this one, uh, will be up there shortly. All, all of our archive is up there. Super wonderful things. So the nonprofit show, again, thank you for joining us. We've had a great time this morning. We're going to hopefully see you tomorrow. And we want to end as we do always. Stay well so you can do well. Thanks so much, everybody.